Welcome! By popular demand, we now have a North Carolina real estate exam midterm review. Hi everyone, I'm Sean Kelly and this will be a midterm based off of the first 10 chapters of the North Carolina real estate exam. Full disclosure, I am taking these questions from a couple of different sources and I didn't really write any of them myself. So there is a chance that you may have already seen some of these, but I am try going to dig into some of the answers and why they are the answers that they are. This way the questions stay professional and relevant and there is just no way I could have come up with some of these ridiculous questions myself. Hey, I forgot to mention, there is a 10% off link down in the description below for North Carolina real estate exam, pre-licensing courses, post-licensing, and continuing education courses for new signups only. So consider grabbing yourself a 10% off link down there. I get a little small kickback as well. You save 50 bucks, I get like 25 bucks. Let's just help each other out, it's a win-win. After writing out this video, I've determined that it would probably be best for me to break out each chapter, chapter one through 20, and have individual sets of questions based off of each one of those chapters. Again, not really written by me, but just that way it's maybe 10, 15 minute long videos instead of this might be an hour, who knows, uh, until I'm done editing. So expect some of those chapter review questions to start coming out over the next few weeks. So remember to subscribe, give this video a thumbs up, and let's get on with it. <sighs> All right, question one. A homeowner would like to install a new HVAC. The home is 50 foot by 70 foot and has 10 foot ceilings. The home also has a 20 foot by 20 foot detached garage. What is the total cubic footage of air in this home? So A, 24,500 cubic feet. B, 2,450,000 cubic feet. 245,000 cubic feet. Or D, 35,000 cubic feet. So for square footage, we would just multiply the width by the height, the 50 foot by the 70 foot. But for cubic feet, we need to multiply all three dimensions, length times width times height. So the 50 times the 20, 70 times the 10 would then give us a 35,000 cubic foot section of air and we needed heated space. So the garage square footage doesn't count. Question two, Lucy is a provisional broker and Tom is a broker in charge of the same firm. Tom has a listing that Lucy's clients would like to purchase. What type of agency relationship will be formed in this transaction? Single agency, dual agency, designated dual agency, or Lucy will be a des designated agent and Tom will be a dual agent. So they work at the same firm so not single agency. It can't be D, you don't have it mix matched agencies. And it can't be C, designated, because a broker in charge overlooks a provisional broker. A BIC is the supervisor of the provisional broker. Therefore, the broker in charge will be overlooking both clients by default. Dual agency must be applied. So question three, when a provisional broker is licensed, they must follow which of the following rules in regards to continuing education. Finish 90 hours of continuing education in the first three years, finish eight hours of continuing education plus 30 hours of post-licensing in the first year, finish eight hours of continuing education every year by June 10th prior to the second renewal of a provisional broker's license. Finish eight hours of continuing education every year, commencing upon completion of the post-licensing requirements. So remember that continuing education is continued forever. Spending 90 hours in class forever is unrealistic. So it's eight hours, that crosses off A. Continuing education is due June 10th, and you can skip over your first year. So you just got done with pre-licensing. Seems unrealistic to have to do eight more hours when you just started. So our answer here will be C, eight hours of continuing education by June 10th, prior to the second renewal. Question four, which is true in regards to members of the North Carolina Real Estate Commission? A, there are nine members who are appointed by the governor. B, all members are of the real estate, are of the real estate profession. C, members are appointed by both the governor and the legislature, and at least three of them must have a real estate license. Or D, the commission must have at least three members from the general public. So this one is based on memorization. 
no real logic here. A helpful reminder though is that there is a mixture of members. There are a mixture of members. So A and B are all one or the other. They're not a mixture. All nine are appointed in A. All are real estate pros in B. There's, that's incorrect. There is a mixture. So our answer here is C. Members are appointed by both the governor and the legislature, and at least three of them must have a real estate license. Question five, the terms meridian and parallels refer to which of the following property legal descriptions? Plat maps, lot and block references, meets and bounds, the government survey rectangular method. So here you must remember the grid lines. Meridians are the vertical ones, baselines are horizontals and parallels are another, right? So here government survey rectangular method is the answer. Question six, which of the following is true in regards to supply and demand in real estate? When demand increases and supply increases, prices tend to increase. As demand decreases and supply increases, prices tend to increase. As supply increases and demand decreases, prices remain the same. As supply decreases and demand increases, prices tend to rise. So that's a lot to hear. You may have to read this one a little bit. I'll give you a few seconds here. So when supply decreases, there are fewer homes. That's what that means. That alone can cause a price increase like we're seeing right now with the virus. Pair that with the demand increasing, more people wanting to buy, and you have a ton of buyer competition. Prices will rise. So the answer here is D. As supply decreases, and demand increases, prices tend to rise. So question seven, an owner of a property reserved a life estate that was conditioned upon the life of a relative. At the end of the life estate, the owner specified that the property was to be transferred to their children. What type of interest do the children have in that property? So we can just knock off B and C right away. Then what's the difference in reversion and remainder well, reversion reverts back to the previous owner. This says it goes to the children though. Therefore, it's the remainder interest. Who is remaining on this? D. Okay, question 7.2. Ronnie and Don took title to a house in Raleigh as joint tenants. The following year, Don sells his interest to Wendy. Which of the following is correct? A, Ronnie and Wendy now own the property as joint tenants. Ronnie and Wendy now own the house as joint tenancy for Ronnie and tenant in common for Wendy. And C, Ronnie and Wendy now own the house as tenants in common. Or D, Ronnie and Wendy own the house as tenants by the entireties. So this is really more memorization here. Know how title is held. Know all of those, the tenants in common, joint tenancy, single, all those things. Um, so the answer here is going to be C. Ronnie and Wendy now own the house as tenants in common. Question eight. A homeowner lives in an HOA where there are protective covenants. A neighbor built a shed on their property that violates the provisions. Provisions. The homeowner would be able to enforce these by a process that would involve contacting the local zoning authority, submitting written notice of the violation to the developer, filing a lawsuit in court, or they cannot be enforced if the neighbor properly attained a variance. So HOA violations is a private matter in the sense that the government does not get involved. Neighbors and the association settle it. Therefore, it has to be done through a lawsuit in court. Question nine, if a seller decides to back out of a valid contract because they have cold feet and the buyer decides to sue the seller for specific performance, what could be the result? A, the seller must reimburse the buyer for all expenses, but will not be forced to sell the home. B, the buyer may seek punitive damages with treble damages. C, the court may force the seller to sell the home. Or D, the seller may force the buyer to rescind the contract. So specific performance requires the defendant to perform the contract. Therefore, the, seller mu the court may force the seller to sell the home. Question 10. All of the following items would normally remain with the property and transfer to the new owner except A. Gas logs attached to pipes in a fireplace B. Awnings that have been installed above the windows 
C, a $4,000 gazebo in the backyard with no foundation, a $100, and D, a $100 pewter switch plate cover next to the front door. So I'll give you an a second to answer this after I say price has no impact whether something is a fixture or not. So in this case, just because a gazebo is expensive, it's $4,000 here, does not mean that it stays. Would an RV stay? Would a car in the garage stay? No. This is not fastened to the ground. It cannot move with the seller, just like a hot tub, just like an RV. Know the question, is it movable? Oh, so the answer here is at C, a $4,000 gazebo in the backyard with no foundation. Question 10.2, which of the following is not an example of a trade fixture? A, an escalator in a department store. B, display shelving and racks in a grocery store. Built-in bar stools and booths in a waffle shop gasoline storage tanks at a service station. So three of these items listed are things that are specific for a business and not very general. Answer here is A, an escalator in department stores. The store, JCPenney's isn't gonna take the escalator out of the mall. Question 11, all of the following would be an appurtenance except a structure on the property. Appurtenance, remember, means things that run with the land. So which one of the th these things would not run with the land? A, a structure on the property. B, the right to exclude others from the property. C, a fence surrounding the property. Or D, growing crops that are attached in the ground. So this is a little tricky here, but in appurtenance, again, are things that run with the land. A through C should really be pretty obvious. D, though, is the answer because of the term implements the right to crops that were the fruit of their labor. If you spent the time farming, you get that yield. You get your yield. That's what's fair. Question 12, a two acre rectangular parcel has four lots. Each lot is 90 feet wide. How many feet deep is each lot? So with these math problems here, work with what they give you. Four lots, each one is 90 feet wide. So you line up four lots, draw it out if needed, I definitely did this, side by side, that gives us a width of 90 plus 90 plus 90 plus 90, which is 360 feet wide. We know one acre is 43,650 feet, so two acres is 87,300 feet, so just divide the 87,300 by 360, our width, to get the, our, yeah, our width to get the length or the depth, I guess. Look, the first two steps are easy. Getting that 360 feet wide and the 87,300 square feet of area. So you might just be asking, well, how do I know to divide those two? Well, if you try multiplying applying those, you'll get millions of feet. And that's obviously not the right answer. So anyway, the answer here with that math is going to be 242 feet deep. So question 13, all of the following are considered to be leasehold interest in real estate except estate for years, estate at will, estate at sufferance, or a life estate. So which one of these is freehold? The top three answers have term limits on them, basically. So therefore, the life estate is straight up ownership. Question 13.2, so which of the following automatically includes the right of survivorship? Tenancy by the entirety? life estate, joint tenancy, or tenancy in common. This is more memorization here. It's that group in chapter two that's so ridiculous, you must know these. Even though there's only gonna be one or two questions on it, there definitely will be one around one of these. So the answer here is tenancy by the entireties. Question 14, which of the following statement is true about timeshares? They do not have to be registered with the North Carolina Real Estate Commission, they may be transferred prior to registering with the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. They must be registered with the North Carolina Real Estate Commission prior to sale, or the timeshare broker may be fined by the North Carolina Real Estate Commission. So this is, again, just a memorization answer. Know that timeshares in this case are similar to subdivisions. It can't be registered prior to sale, just like a subdivision lot can't close until there is final approval. So the answer is C, they must be registered with the North Carolina Real Estate Exam Real Estate Commission prior to sale. 
Question 15. A neighbor has been using a lot that is adjacent to them for a long period of time. They regularly mow the grass and have had a garage and shed constructed on the lot. If the original owner decides to sell the lot, does the neighbor have any legal rights to the property? So remember that, well, let me read them off. A, yes, the neighbor is a squatter. If they use the property for the statutory period, they may claim ownership by adverse possession. B, no, squatters are never allowed to acquire property. C, yes, but only if the neighbor files with the clerk of court and pays fair market value for the property. D, no, the neighbor may not require acquire the property because they never had the owner's permission to use the property. So remember the acronym OCEAN, Open, Continuous, Exclusive, Adverse, and Notorious. The neighbor is openly mowing grass continuously, has structures on it, etc. The answer here is going to be A. The neighbor is a squatter. If they use a property for a statutory period, they may claim ownership by adverse possession. Question 16. A buyer had their offer accepted by the seller, but has decided to cancel within the due diligence period. In this situation, A. The listing broker agent must complete the earnest money release form with the seller's and buyer's signature before releasing any earnest monies to the buyer. B. The buyer is entitled to a refund of both their earnest money and their due diligence fee. The earnest money must be returned to the buyer immediately. Or D. The broker can only release the money to the buyer without the seller's consent if the broker is acting as a dual agent. So first off, this is allowed. A buyer can cancel and they will just lose out on the due diligence. Therefore, they should get their earnest money back. The answer here is A. There is still a process to get that money though. Question 17. None of the following are essential elements of a contract to purchase real property except earnest money, consideration, due diligence fee, recording prior to closing. So earnest money and due diligence are elements. Consideration is typical. And recording prior to closing is mandatory. Attorneys need to record before you are technically closed. Therefore, it is consideration. It's typical, but there are unilateral contracts where one party is not obligated in any way. Question 18. A live tenant who has received a conventional life estate may do all of the following except sell their interest in the property, will their interest to their children, encumber the property, or obtain a loan against the property. So when a life tenant dies, that property reverts back to the owner or remainder interest. Therefore, a life tenant can't just pass it on to whoever they want. That's not the deal. Therefore, the answer is B, will their interest to their children. A life tenant cannot will this to their children because it's not their decision to make. This contract is based off of that tenant's own life. Question 19, two properties are adjacent to each other. One benefits from an easement. In regard to the benefiting property, what is the easement called? A, dominant easement. B, servient easement. C, easement in gross. D, easement appurtenant. So the dominant tenement is the one benefiting. They need the easement appurtenant to get their home, which dominates over the servient tenement. Answer here is D, easement appurtenant. Question 20, a 16 year old enters into a contract to purchase an investment property from a couple in their 40s. What is the status of the contract? A, contract is voidable at the seller's option, the 40 year old's option. B, contract is enforceable as long as all the essential elements are present. C, contract is void because the older couple entered into it with a minor. Or D, the contract is voidable at the buyer's option, the kid's option. So here's kind of a trick question. B states that the contract is enforceable. Well, it is to a degree. This answer isn't necessarily wrong, but D is the better option. The contract can only be voided by the kid. Question 21. The encumbrance that makes priority over all other liens on a property is A. The lien for any unpaid property taxes. B. Recorded mechanics lien. C. Liens of the homeowners association. D. Federal IRS income tax liens. So property taxes is always number one, except for foreclosures. If foreclosures were an answer here, that one would be correct. But here it's A. The lien for any unpaid property taxes. Question 22. Ben and Jerry decided to purchase a property and took title as tenants in common. If Jerry dies intestate, which means without a will, 
Who will control his interest in the property? A, whoever Jerry has named in his will. Well, I would have gotten this answer wrong if I didn't have the answers in front of me on this one, to be honest. Question 23. All of the following would create an agency relationship except A, the payment of money, B, a written agency contract between the buyer and the agent, C, an oral buyer agency agreement, D, the actions of the parties. So money never creates a relationship. Plus, why would a potential client pay for something up front? Answer here is A, the payment of money. Question 24. The process by which the government takes title to private land for the public use and pays the owner just compensation is known as A, eminent domain, B, condemnation, C, easement by necessity, D, police power. So this should come down to a 50-50 question pretty quick. I confused these two during one of my chapters as well and someone called me out on it. So it is very simple, not sure how I swapped it out. Eminent domain is the ability, the rule, the law for the government to take your property. While condemnation is the actual physical act or process. So in this answer, this question, the answer is B, condemnation. It's the actual act or the process of them taking that private land. Question 25, in a cooperative, what the buyer receives is an interest in a corporation's stock in a proprietary lease, jointly owned tenancy in common, their unit and an undivided interest in the common area, or D, the ownership of the building by the entireties. So let's go a little quicker here. You don't actually own the place, you own a share of the place which gives you a lease. So I'm gonna try to go a little bit quicker through these other questions, there's still like 50 left. You don't actually own the place, you own a share of the place which gives you a lease. The answer here is A. Question 26. A licensee tells a prospective buyer that the home they are buying contains great insulation and low cost utility bills without doing any research or investigation themselves. If the insulation in the home turns out to be of inferior quality and the heating bills are extremely high, the representation made by the licensee to the buyer would be best described, classified as puffing, willful omission, negligent misrepresentation, or willful misrepresentation. So puffing is more when advertising and using glamorous terms. Omission is leaving info out. Negligent is not knowing. Willful is knowing. So you don't know that the insulation is good or bad. You're just blabbering. Therefore, it's negligent misrepresentation. C. Question 27. John is the broker in charge at a firm. Paul is a provisional broker there, and Sally is a full broker there. Fred is a full broker at a different firm. In this situation, who can properly be named as designated agents in a real estate, real estate transaction? John and Sally, John and Paul, Paul and Fred, Fred and Sally. So designated agents basically means working at the same firm. We kind of went over this in an earlier question. So we can knock Fred out of here already. Then a provisional broker can't be a designated agent with someone that's supervising them. Again, remember, with the broker in charge. Therefore, it's John and Sally. A, a broker in charge overlooks a provisional broker. Remember that. Question 28. <laughs> I feel like I'm sounding angry. I'm not. Uh, I'm just reading a lot. <laughs> Question 28. The statute of frauds requires that A. Deeds must be recorded to be valid. B. Deeds must be notarized. C. Contracts for the exchange of real estate must be in writing in order to be enforceable. D. All leases for longer than one year must be in writing. So the Connor Act deals with recording and is dream oil. The statute of frauds is dream oils and requires documents to be in writing. And then deed shouldn't even make sense anyways. It's three years or later there. So the answer here is C. Question 29. All of the following would be an encumbrance on a parcel of real estate except a real estate, real estate taxes, a loan made by a bank, an easement, unpaid medical bills that are in collections. The first three are pretty obvious and you've heard it a dozen times. But medical bills have nothing to do with running with the land. D here is the answer. Question 30. The ad valerum tax rate may adjust once at least every eight years. 
once at least every four years, once a year, once at least every two years. So appraised value is every eight years. The horizontal adjustment of your tax rate is four years and tax rate is once a year. Question 31. How many acres are there in the following legal description? The north half of the southeast quarter and the southeast quarter of the northeast quarter. So the southeast quarter is 640 acres divided by four. That's, that's 160, right? We're asking for a quarter of the entire block of 640 acres. That's 160. Then the north half of that 160 is 80. You're just kind of working backwards here. Then that and there separates the two pieces of land. So then the northeast quarter, again, of 640 acres divided by four, that's another 160. Then a quarter of 160 is 40. Now we add those two together, the 80 plus the 40 to get 120 acres. Question 32, which characteristics, I'm talking with my hands so much that it's hard to actually highlight the answer over here on the screen. Which characteristics are correct regarding a planned unit development or a PUD? So there is typically no homeowners association associated with a PUD. PUD differs from a normal subdivision in that buildings may be clustered together rather than complying with normal lot size and setback, which leaves more room for open spaces and recreational areas. PUDs can only exist in areas that have spot zoning. Or D, the homeowners in a PUD hold title to the common areas as tenants in common. So part of PUD is cluster zoning where houses are grouped up so there can be more green space and parks in a neighborhood and things like that and trails. So the answer here is B. Question 33. During the previewing of a property, the prospective buyer asks the listing agent about whether or not a garage located on the property is within the boundaries of the property line. If the garage extends over the property line, which of the following statements is, is false? First of all here, just knowing as an agent, always recommend a buyer get a survey. So A, the agent should advise the buyer to get a survey. Okay, which one of the following statements is false? <laughs> I was like, that answer is correct. That answer is correct. So it's not, not actually correct in this, whatever. B, the seller is required to disclose the existence of the encroachment on the seller's property disclosure. C, the existence of an easement for such a purpose would solve an encroachment problem. D, if the garage has existed for a required statutory period, the issue may be resolved by the existence of a prescriptive easement. So which of these is false? The answer here is B. The seller is required to disclose the existence of encroachment on the seller's property disclosure. If the seller doesn't know, then they don't have to disclose necessarily, right? The buyer needs to get a survey. It's on them. Question 34. The annual property tax bill is 3,780. If the tax rate is 180 mils, what was the assessed value of the property? A. 2,100. B. 21,000. C. 210,000. Or D. 680 and 40, $680.40. So first of all, two of these is just pretty ridiculous. $2,100 for the value of the property and $680 value of the property. That's some cheap land. So with mills, we move the decimal over three spaces, 0 0.180. So a 3,700, $3,780 tax bill divided by the 0 0.180 is an assessed value of $21,000. Question 35, Jack, a buyer was never provided with a residential property disclosure statement by the seller. Under North Carolina law, Jack has the right to A, cancel his contract within five days, B, cancel his contract at any time prior to closing, C, cancel his contract within three days of the date of his offer, or D, cancel his contract within three days of the date the contract was accepted. So a disclosure should be reviewed and signed pretty much with an offer. If that isn't the case, Jack has three days to cancel after the contract was accepted. The answer is D. Question 36. The reason that deeds are recorded under Connor Act is because A. Deeds are subject to the statute of frauds. B. Recording provides actual notice to all the properties in the transaction. C. Recording provides constructive notice of the transfer. And D. The Connor Act does not require deeds to be recorded. 
So recording provides notice to the parties and the public. The answer here is C, recording provides constructive notice of the transfer. Question 37. In many states other than North Carolina, property is considered to be equal between husband and wife. Any property acquired during the marriage is deemed to have been attained by mutual effort. When a spouse dies, the surviving spouse retains their one half interest in the property and the other half of the estate is inherited by the descendant's heirs. In what manner do these people hold title? Joint, ten joint tenancy, tenancy in common, community property, or tenancy by the entireties. So this is, again, just a memory one. Guys, chapter two is hardly tested, yet there is so much junk that you have to memorize here. So there will be at least one question on forms of ownership. Answer here is C, community property. Question 38. A licensee who is involved in a transaction as a dual agent must, one, disclose and get the consent of all parties involved, two, avoid discussions about motivations, prices, and terms with all properties. So as a dual agent, you have a responsibility to be fair to both parties and you must disclose your situation. So the answer here is C, both one and two. Question 39, a valid and enforceable contract must have all of the following elements except contain a meetings of the mind, be for a legal purpose, monetary consideration, competent parties. Again, money doesn't have to be included in a contract. Answer is C. Question 40, all of the following would be ways in which an agency relationship can be terminated without the parties incurring any further liability except death of the principal, destruction of the property, unilateral revocation, revoking, I don't know how you pronounce it that way, revoking, filing of bankruptcy by the seller. So death, destruction, and bankruptcy gets someone off the hook, and that's kind of a sad way to put it. But unilateral revocation is the answer. Only one party can decide to terminate. Question 41. A deed that only warrants claims and encumbrances against the property during the term of the grantor's ownership is a general warranty deed, bargain and sale deed, quit claim deed, special warranty deed. So this is during the term of the grantor's ownership means that the warranty is only for a limited time in history. A general warranty deed is essentially forever, so it's a special warranty deed. The other two are really far off. Question 42. The following statements are correct about tenancy by the entirety, except property that is purchased after marriage, if held in both the husband and wife's names, will by default be titled as tenants by the entirety. If a married couple becomes separated, any property they acquired after marriage will remain as tenants by the entirety unless they take action to change the ownership status. Property acquired prior to the marriage does not automatically become tenancy by the entirety ownership. If a married couple becomes divorced, any property acquired during the marriage that was deeded as tenancy by the entireties will remain as such. So which one of these is false? Death, divorce, or agreement all in tenancy by the entirety. So the answer here is D. Question 33. All of the following would result in termination of an easement except sale of the property, a merger, mutual agreement, abandonment. So easements run with the land. That means when it sells. sells. A, sale of the property. Question 44. What is the typical type of agency between a seller and a real estate firm? Universal, general, special, or servient. So universal has unlimited powers. General agents have some powers like a property manager. And we are special agents. Servient is a trick answer because we are basically servants. And that's kind of what it sounds like. Answer here is C. All right, question 45. Which of the following statements are correct regarding the issuance of title insurance? The title insurance will insure the owner against any encroachments or issues with the property. The title insurance protects the purchaser. The title insurance only protects against errors in the recorded documents and any undisclosed liens or encumbrances. Or D, the title insurance should be obtained by the owner and protect the owner's investment and equity. So encroachments are uncovered during surveys. It's why we recommend them. Uh, it protects the purchaser in a way, but not directly. It protects against errors in the documents. So the answer here is C. 
Question 46. The annual taxes on a parcel of property are $2,800. These taxes have been paid by the seller. When the property is transferred, how will the proration of these taxes be handled on the closing disclosure? So they tell you $2,800, but that's irrelevant to this question. Um, so the sell so A, the debit to the buyer and a debit to the seller. A debit to the buyer and a credit to the seller. A credit to the buyer and a debit to the seller. A credit to the buyer and a credit to the seller. <laughs> that just sounds crazy. So the seller has already paid the entire year. They didn't own the property the whole year though in this scenario. So the buyer pays some and the seller gets some back. You debit the buyer and credit the seller. Answer here is B. Question 47. Under the Federal Sherman Antitrust Act, which of the following statements would a real estate professional be legally permitted to make? A. Informing, informing a consumer that another company does not train agents well. Telling a prospective seller that if they check around, they would find that your commission is about the average of the market. C. Informing a client that your broker insists that the commission be 7%. Telling a buyer to avoid looking at a certain listing because the agent listing, it works with the company with a bad reputation. So Sherman Antitrust says that we can't use general terms when referring to our commission due to price fixing. So we could tell them that our commission is 7% though. Why? Because we can negotiate what we want to get paid. But by not saying that another firm does this or the market usually does this, can't do it that way. Question 48. Which of the following statements is correct regarding the seller's property disclosure statement? So the seller must disclose all material issues with the property. If the statement is not provided to the buyer, the buyer has five days to cancel the contract. C. The agent may be liable for the seller's omissions if the agent did not disclose material facts. Or D. Agents and sellers are only liable for the representations they make. Okay, so B, it's, so for B, we can cross that off because it's three days to cancel the contract, not five days. Answer here is C, the agent may be liable. You always disclose material facts. Question 49, once a provisional broker has taken possession of earnest money and due diligence fees, A, the earnest money and due diligence fees must be deposited into a trust account. The B, the provisional broker may hold the earnest money until the contract is accepted and the due diligence fee should be given to the seller immediately. C, all monies should be delivered to the broker in charge immediately. D, the due diligence fee is refundable during the due diligence period, but the earnest money is not. So this is talking about a provisional broker. So D is obviously not right. Due diligence isn't refundable. Earnest is. So this one is C, all money should be delivered to the broker in charge immediately. Question 50, all offers to purchase and documents to clients should be delivered. This is one that I had gotten wrong in the past and you may see this on the test because there's two correct answers here. Within three calendar days, immediately but never later than three business days, immediately, or D, immediately but never later than three calendar days. So this was a legit test question. There are two correct answers here. A is correct within three calendar days, but D is even more correct immediately, but never later than three calendar days. Question 51, which of the following is correct regarding the cancellation of a timeshare agreement in North Carolina? The buyer has five days to cancel and the developer must refund their money within 10 days. The buyer has three days to cancel and the developer may refund their money within 15 days. The buyer has five days to cancel and the developer must, must refund their money within 30 days. And D, the buyer has three days to cancel and the developer must refund their money within 10 days. So timeshares have those five for five rules, right? Almost everything is in regards to the number five. So we know here that it is five days. So that cancels out B and D. Then we know that it has to be a month. 30 days. So that's memorization there. Answer here is C. Five days to cancel, refund their money within 30 days. Question 52. An offer to purchase would include all of the following except A. Confirmation of the agency relationship of the parties. B. The fees to be charged of the parties. C. An accurate description of the property. D. The obligations and duties of the buyer to the seller. 
So you need the agency relationship, you need the description, and the obligations. But fees to be charged are on a closing disclosure, on a CD. Question 53. This type of legal description would be used in a heavily populated area and is usually used to convey the smallest parcels in subdivisions. Meets and bounds, government survey, lot and block, or street addresses. So think about a city center and a neighborhood here. While we use street addresses, that's not the legal description, so we cross that off. That's an informal description. So we would use lot and block. The answer is C. Question 54. All of the following would be terminated at the death of the properties except an offer to purchase that has not yet been accepted, a listing agreement, a life estate, a purchase contract that has been fully signed and accepted by all parties. So if an offer hasn't been accepted and someone dies, the offer dies. A listing agreement dies. A life estate is terminated. That's literally the definition of a life estate. So a contract that is underway is the one that will not be terminated. The annual taxes are question 55. The annual taxes on a parcel of property are $2,520. These taxes have not been paid by the seller. If closing occurs on November 15th and the escrow agent is instructed to collect and pay the full taxes, how will this appear on the closing disclosure? So you find the daily rate with these cases. So $2,520 divided by 360 days in real estate, which gives you $7 a day. So you multiply that amount by the amount of days that the seller had the property, which in this case is 315 days. That's 10 months and 15 days, something like that. So 315 days times $7 daily rate is $2,205 that the seller still needs to pay up. Therefore, they are debited that amount and the buyer is responsible for that remaining $315. Therefore, the answer here is D. The buyer will be debited $315 taken from the buyer, and the seller will also be debited $2,205 taken from the seller. Question 56. Which of the following is incorrect regarding designated agency? The firm's broker in charge makes the designation. A firm may inform a consumer that designated agency is not available to them. C, the brokers in designated agency must work for different firms. Or D, the firm must have policies and procedures in place to enforce designated agency rules. So this one should be pretty easy. The whole point of dual agency and designated dual agency is when two agents work in the same firm. So the answer is C, the brokers in designated agency must work in different firms. That's why it's incorrect regarding designated agency. Okay, question 57. A bargain and sale deed would contain which of the following covenants? Covenant against encumbrances, covenant of further assurances, covenant of season, which is spelled wrong there. There should be S-E-I-S-I-N, -I, -I, I believe. Or D, covenant of quiet enjoyment. So the answer here is C, and C, covenant of season means essentially the grantor promises the grantee that he or she is getting a fee simple to the property. So it means exactly what they're asking, a bargain and sale deed. We need to have that in the covenant. I don't know. I probably would have gotten that one wrong, to be honest, too. <laughs> Question 58. The substitution of an existing contract for another contract is a concept known as A, assignment, B, reallocation, C, novation, or D, rescission. So this one is purely vocab memorization here. You should definitely know assignment and novation. Novation is the substitute of a contract, which gives you C. Question 59. A purchase contract in which one of the parties has made a substantial misrepresentation or omission is A. Void B. Enforceable C. Voidable by the party damaged by the misrepresentation or D. Unenforceable so if one party breaks the rules, the contract is not void. That wouldn't be fair to the other one that is following the rules. So contracts are binding. Enforceable doesn't make sense here because of C. 
It is now voidable by the person who followed the rules. They can choose to avoid it or not. So know the difference between void and voidable. Void means it is void, it is done, it is canceled. While voidable means it is able to be voided. Question 60. Which type of property ownership blends ownership of a unit with tenancy in common? Townhomes, condominiums, cooperatives, or planned unit developments? Puts. Ownership with tenancy in common. So you would own your unit, but share an area with your neighbors. Which one of these is like that? It's a condo. You typically share a lobby or something. Question 61. When someone dies testate, that means with a will this time, the people who inherit the descendant's real property from an executor would be receiving A, legacy, B, bequest, C, devise, or D, descent. So another vocab word here just from memory. When someone dies with a will, testate, the answer is devise. Question 62. Under which of the following types of listing agreements will an agent be paid only if they or another agent find the buyer, but not if the seller sells the property on their own? A. Open listing. B. Net listing. C. Exclusive right to sell listing. Or D. Exclusive agency listing. So exclusive right to sell listing is a normal process here where we get paid no matter what. Therefore, exclusive agency listing is where you get paid unless the other owner finds the buyer. The other two don't make sense in this scenario at all. Answer here is D. Question 63. All of the following would be considered involuntary alienation of real estate except involuntarily, meaning not wanting to, A, a foreclosure by a lender, B, a condemnation proceeding, C, a transfer in a will, or a D, a sheet. So involuntary means that it's out of our control, basically. So foreclosure and condemnation are out of your control, in a sense, so no. You do write your own will, though, so you do have control there. It's C. Question 64. When an owner of real property sells or transfers it and retains their right or interest in the mineral rights, they are creating... A, an easement that must appear in the deed, an encroachment that affects subsequent ownership of the land, C, a reservation and exception that must appear in the deed, or D, an illegal interference in the bundle of rights of the buyer. So an easement is incorrect, that's more of a right of way. An encroachment is wrong, that's more of a structure or something that's built across property lines. So it is C, an exception on the deed, and it is legal. Is that it? Wow, <laughs> cool. So that was a ton to take in. If you find any mistakes in this video, please comment them down below. I'll be sure to pin them to my very top comment. It's, it would be really awesome if you helped me out and some of the other people who are in your same exact shoes. Agents typically consider themselves partners, not competitors. So just help each other out. I hope this all helped. There will be a final review to come. So not only if you have any mistakes that you've caught, but if you have any recommendations, should I add music? Should I read faster? Should I make less questions? Whatever it is, um, I'd be more than happy to apply some of those concepts to the final review. Thank you so much. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss out on any other future videos. Thank you and I will see you on the final review.